Episode of Progress, Potential, and Possibilities, discussions with fascinating people designing a better tomorrow for all of us. I'm your host, Ira Pastor. Welcome, everybody, again to another episode of our show. Today, bringing you another really awesome guest uh, involved in creating a better tomorrow for all of us. Uh, today, we have the honor of being joined by Dr. Shavonda Jacobs-Young, who uh, is the Undersecretary for Research, Education, and Economics and Chief Scientist uh, at the United United States Department of Agriculture, also known as our USDA, uh, where she oversees uh, the organization's mission and their 8,500 employees and $4 billion budget, uh, involved in advancing agricultural research, innovation, uh, data and extension across a range of different agricultural issues, including topics like climate smart agriculture, nutrition security, uh, equity, and of course, strengthening uh, food supply chains. And as chief scientist, uh, she's involved in advising the Secretary of Agriculture uh, and many other senior officials uh, on scientific matters and chairs the, uh, the USDA Science Council. Council, uh, which convenes all parts of the USDA's uh, scientific enterprise. Uh, prior to being appointed by President Biden uh, uh, to serve in this role, uh, Dr. Jacobs Young was administrator for the uh, the Agricultural Research uh, Service, which is uh, basically the chief scientific in-house research agency of the USDA. Uh, she also led the Office of International Research Programs, which was responsible for uh, their liaison with various international partners. And uh, um, in addition to all that, she has served as acting director of NIFA, which is the National Institute of Food and Agriculture, which provides leadership and funding programs uh, to broadly advance agriculture-related sciences, uh, also served as a senior uh, policy analyst for agriculture at the White House's Office uh, of Science and Technology Policy, or OSTP. Uh, Dr. Jacobs Young is a native of Georgia. Uh, she did her undergraduate degree in pulp and paper sciences, went on to do her master's and PhD in wood and paper sciences, all at uh, North Carolina. Carolina State University. She's also a graduate of America University Key Executive Leadership Public Policy Implementation Program and a fellow of both uh, the American Association for the Advancement of Science and National Academy for Public Administration. We're honored to have her with us today. A lot of really interesting themes to get into today. Uh, Dr. Shavanda Jacobs-Young, thank you so much for taking the time out of your schedule to talk to us for a little while. Thank you so much for having me today. It's great having you. Um, I'm looking forward to these themes uh, as I spent a little time in them myself over some earlier parts of my career, but I would love to to start off uh, as we typically do by handing you the floor for a little bit. Uh, if you could take us back to uh, a little bit about you, everything from where you grew up, um, your development of your intellectual interest in, in, in STEM and agriculture, and of course, pulp and paper sciences. I've, I've driven through Georgia a lot and I, I know around Savannah where that industry kicks in. Um, talk a little bit about your background, if you would. Yeah, fantastic. Well, I tell you, it's uh, it's an interesting um, journey when I look back now after being at USDA for about a little over 20 years, about 22 years in, in service here in agricultural sciences. Um, as, you, as you mentioned, I'm from Georgia and um, very early on, I'm that kid that you know, I think about third grade, I asked for a chemistry set for Christmas, you know, the one with the little mm -hmm. microscope and all yep. of the experiments. And um, I always had a curiosity about how things work, uh, still do. Uh, and it was something that has always driven me. And so I, I matriculated through high school in preparation for a college degree in engineering. And so in Georgia, there in Augusta, Georgia, they had a program that prepared minority students um, in high school to be competitive, to be accepted into the engineering programs uh, across the country. 
And so my my goal was to go to Georgia Tech, become a chemical engineer, and um, you know, then all will be right with the world. And it was interesting that at some point in my uh in my high school year, you know, as I've already been accepted to Georgia Tech, I've already um chosen my roommate and I'm I'm ready to go. And and a, a high school counselor asked me to go over to our local paper mill. And as you said, you've driven through Georgia. And so you've, you've, you've smelled the presence of paper mills. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I came to know that that smell is considered to smell like money is what I'm told. <laughs> but <laughs> most people just think it smells like sulfur. Well, in any case, I was invited to go to a listening session. And it was being held by the Pulp and Paper Foundation, that was something I'd never heard of in life. And um, it was interesting because they presented an opportunity to go to North Carolina State University, major in paper science and engineering, and it was called Pulp and Paper Science and Technology at that time, and get two degrees in five years. So you could get the, the Pulp and Paper degree and the Kimmy degree with an extra year. And so... Uh, Things changed and quickly I was off to Raleigh, North Carolina. I think at that point in my life, having left the state of Georgia really uh, once in my life and uh, moving to North Carolina was uh, was an adventure. And so I had an opportunity to go to North Carolina State and study something that no one ever heard of. And I will tell you that it has been a, a, a great conversation starter all my career. <laughs> because people <laughs> want to know what the world is pulp and paper science. And so, and, and just quite frankly, they're chemical engineers who who produce paper products, disposable diapers, paper towels, facial tissue. Um, they're engineering wood products to be able to have the properties that we come to know and love and need in our lives, facial tissue. We want to use it and have it stay intact. Uh, uh, toilet paper, you want to use it and you don't want it to stay intact. And so all of that <laughs> is engineering. I know people think it just happens, but it doesn't. And so those are lots of engineers out there every day trying to make those uh, products in a more sustainable way, use a renewable uh, sources like trees. Yeah, it's it's interesting. I you know I was uh, and I have no experience in this, but I, I enjoyed sort of looking at uh, some of um, your your research papers from back in the day with with really interesting titles like determining the topochemical effects of enzyme pretreatment on delignification in conventional craft pulping, which I sort of get is <laughs> a little bit when I when I read into it, but it you know quite advanced concepts on ultimately how we take trees and, and do a lot of value added things with them. You've, you know, you've written uh, about cellulosic ethanol, uh, a really cool program you were funding uh, at ARS in terms of uh, uh, not trees this time, but chicken feathers and how, you know, we can take these 3 billion pounds of waste that we produce in this country and make circuit boards out of them. A, a common theme here of really uh, value beyond sort of the core agricultural product. And I'd love to just, if you could give us a little uh, intro to sort of how you thought about some of these big questions as you were uh, progressing through your career, not just in the lab, but as an administrator of some of this research. Yeah, so it's interesting because as a graduate student studying, um, you know, ways to improve craft pulping and to, um, you know, so paper in most cases is a commodity product. And so I didn't know then I was preparing for my career in agriculture. And so our ability to keep the paper machine running, to be able to save money, to reduce inputs, to reduce the environmental impact of the paper process, being able to use less chemicals that could potentially be an issue at the end in the process. And that's where enzymes and some of the other um, innovative techniques came into play. Well, well, what I know now as the chief scientist for the USDA is that um, all of the all of that training has come in handy as we work with the producers and consumers across the United States and many around the world is how do we help those producers thrive, yeah. um, whether they are small, mid-sized or large producers. And one way to do that is to create new markets. And so being able to take uh, portions of the process that in some cases would have been waste to be able to develop a, a value-added product creates an income stream for a producer or um, an innovator, a, a small business. And so when you talk about chicken feathers, you know, they're lightweight. They have properties that can be, you know, uh, producing uh, some of the fibers and materials that we use in things like cars and other, and other venues. And so it's a, an important way to be able to look at a process. When I worked on a paper machine as an undergrad, um, 
and as a, a, a young professional, uh, very shortly, let me just put that in there. Uh, if anything went wrong with that paper machine, we had to walk, we had to back walk it and be able to find out exactly where the problem lies because every minute that machine was not running, we were losing money. And so I've been able to apply that skill to agriculture, being able to work with the best scientists in USDA and many of our folks out in the field to be able to determine we have a big, big problem. Now let's walk it back to find out where the, the fundamental issues are and let's find an innovative solution to be able to solve them. Awesome, outstanding. So um, an interesting thing I learned in sort of getting ready for this episode that it was none other than uh, President Abraham Lincoln that established uh, our Department of Agriculture. And, and back in 1862, it had a total of eight employees <laughs> at the time to sort of broadly look at, at rural development, agriculture, and so forth. Uh, progressed a long way since then. You're doing quite a bit, uh, uh, quite a bit more. Um, walk us through a little bit about um, the REE, or Research Education and Economics, your role as chief scientist, and a little bit, I'm, I'm sure you get uh, your phone rings a lot that, you know, hey, uh, we have a fungal outbreak uh, on the strawberries in California. We had a frost in Florida. The president wants to know about some tariff thing and rice or whatever. Um, and they all come to your, to your desk, probably. Um, talk about your, your typical day and what it means to be uh, not just, you know, the head of RE, but the chief scientist of our USDA. Well, thank you for Thank you for asking. I think that it is um, probably an area, when I think about agriculture research, we, we contribute so much to uh, society, to the quality of life of Americans. Um, and very few people have the awareness about what agriculture research actually contributes to their lives every day. You know, USDA, when Abraham Lincoln, President Abraham Lincoln created the department, it's the people's department, quite frankly. Right. We touch every person every day, from the food they eat, the cotton and the fibers, to the clothes that they wear. You know, there are so many ways that we touch Americans. Um, and so it's been important for me um, in my over two decades working with agriculture scientists to be able to continue to, I would say, um, grow our ambition about our opportunities for solutions to some of the challenges that we face. Um, as the REE Undersecretary, I have uh, four agencies under, under my leadership, which um, in my intro you talked about, at some point I was head of two of the agencies. Yeah. Um, and then there's a fifth component called the Office of the Chief Scientist. And at some point in my career, I was head of that office as well. Um, together, we have about 8,500 employees, about a $4 billion um, research budget, and um, considerably, uh, considerably making sure that we make the connections between public, private, philanthropic, um, and making sure that we find the solutions to some of the challenges we face. Um, NIFA, the National Institute of Food and Agriculture, is our, our, our closest partner to our land-grant university system. Um, President Abraham Lincoln, in his infinite wisdom, I mean, think about what was happening during that time in our history and his forethought to be able to create the Department of Agriculture. Well, he also created the land-grant university system. Yeah. And so for all that time, USDA and the land grant universities have been walking lockstep in partnership, really helping to ensure that the U.S. has the most abundant, most nutritious, most affordable, diverse food supply anywhere. And so, um, so we partner very heavily with the land grant university system. So NIFA is our conduit to that, um, to the universities. And then the Agriculture Research Service is our intramural research agency. And we have about 2,000 PhD scientists in ARS. Um, I would tell you it's been one of the highlights of my career to be administrator for ARS. We have a lot of the, I would say the best and the brightest scientists anywhere working on all topics important to agriculture. And then we have the Economic Research Service and they're doing all that um, wonderful economic research that really tells us what's happening out there in terms of how about what type of impacts are our policies having. You know, when we think about things, maybe a charter note that we recently saw okay. that talks about the, the shift between in-home eating and eating out. 
I'm just going to put it simply. Those are not the words that they use, but mm -hmm. we're able to see what trends are happening so that we can be able to have informed decision making inside the department and for others. Um, we look at things like food insecurity across the country. They're doing the food security reports. Um, they do a lot of wonderful, important economic research. And then we have the National Agriculture Statistics Service. And I'm excited to share that NAS is uh, the leader for our census of agriculture for the United States. And very soon, we're going to release the new results of the census of agriculture. So I'm extremely excited about that. In addition to the census of agriculture, they're putting out some 400 reports all year long, telling us about all the data that's important to agriculture, what's being grown, what's proposed to be grown, what do we know? And so that data is really supporting a lot of the decisions across our country and around the world. And a part of your responsibilities uh, also um, involve putting together, you know, what's called the USDA Science and Research Strategy, uh, and you recently released um, it's uh, the 2023-2026 strategy, cool tagline, cultivating scientific innovation, and, and this is an amazing document, and we're going to put a link to it uh, in the bio of the show, but clearly, and, and I come back, uh, it's a lot more than calories, let's just say, everything from uh, nutrition and health climate solutions, climate resiliency, um, and, and you get into some really um, bleeding edge stuff here, everything from microbiome research, which is a hot topic for human health, but agriculture has its own microbiome, gene editing, uh, you know, virulence factors and pathogens, and then obviously the broad thing about, you know, how we pull carbon out of the air, you know, <laughs> everything you were doing uh, in your PhD. Uh, uh, talk a little bit about this plan, because it is quite extensive, and it is a lot more than what we normally think about agriculture and, and everything it touches. Yeah, so, um, you know, it is a three-year plan with a, a long-term vision, and it is it is an opportunity for us to provide what I like to think of as a guidepost for the global agriculture science community about where we think the high priorities are for us being able to meet the challenges that uh, we're faced in agriculture. It was going to help shape the future of U.S. agriculture and forestry because we need to be more prosperous, profitable, and sustainable for many. And, and not just our large organizations, our large farms. We want to be able to have all be able to be prosperous, be, be mm -hmm. profitable, to be productive and sustainable. And so in our science and research strategy, our priorities, you'll notice that they all have action words because yeah. it's time <laughs> for action. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about what those priorities are, you know, accelerating innovative technologies and practices. You know, we, we can't we can't afford to um, have a lot of incremental steps. We want those steps are important. However, we also need to make leaps and bounds in our innovation and technologies for agriculture. We recognize that the technologies that are now available to us, like artificial intelligence, machine learning, mm -hmm. a lot of the broadband that USDA has been so critical in leading um, place in broadband in many of our communities, especially our rural communities across the country, all of that's going to allow us to really raise our game in terms of integrating technology and how we grow our food. And, uh, and those things are important. And all the while we're doing that, climate change is a backdrop against everything we do. So we yeah. want to really drive climate smart solutions and really making sure that we're at the forefront of meeting the challenges we have around meeting the goals that we've set globally around 1.5 for meeting our, our climate goals. And so we have a huge responsibility in agriculture. We want to be part of the solution. And so we've been working very hard in that space. Um, uh, just an example of how we're driving climate smart solution. This is our aim for climate initiative that okay. the United States in the partnership with the United Arab Emirates, uh, we've, we've sponsored that leadership. And when we talk about bringing global partners together, um, just at COP28 in Dubai last late last year, we announced that we've, we've raised over $17 billion to come together to really drive innovation for climate. And so we're very excited about that initiative and um, happy to share a link with you so we can share it with all of your Absolutely. listeners. Um, just an exciting time to be able to see us really have a vision and see it come to fruition. Mm -hmm. And so we're very excited to see what comes out of that. 
Uh, our next priority is bolstering nutrition security um, mm -hmm. and health. And we'll talk a little bit about our SEND initiative, ho hopefully yep. later in this, in this um, conversation. Um, but it's important for us to take all of the research that we're conducting inside USDA and across our land grant system to be able to improve nutrition security and health. Food security, which is a, a, the, the act of making sure that people have enough to eat, is critically important. And we also want to make sure that people have nutritious food. And mm -hmm. so we need to we need to do both, increase food security and nutrition security. And so we'll talk a little bit about that. Yep. Uh, we want to cultivate resilient ecosystems. Um, you know, I, I know you watch the news like most of us, and we see every day that there's some place around the world where we're seeing a weather event. Yeah. We're seeing some sort of event or a pest or a new disease. And we have to ensure that our producers, no matter where they are, can be successful. And so we need to get in there with science, with innovation, to be able to create those resilient ecosystems so that we are not vulnerable and that we can uh, resist and be to you know, tolerate some of the new pests and diseases we face and be able to recover from extreme weather events. And so that's going to be critically important. And then the um, the last priority in the in the vision is to translate research into action. Yep. Um, we talked a lot about this in COP twenty eight in Dubai late last year. It's just time. It, it really is time. It's yep. time to act. Um, you know, the vision uh, for the uh, the strategy is wonderful. Um, it's a beautiful publication. I encourage everyone to get a copy and to read it. However, if we fail to act on the things that are listed in that strategy, uh, we, what have we accomplished? And right. so it's not enough to produce the plan. We have to implement and act on it. And so we're encouraging everyone to join us in helping to meet the goals that we set forward in the priority statement. Yeah, well, let's let's talk about uh, because you you are implementing uh, quite well. Uh, you know, reading about things, uh, we can talk about sort of the first topic um, that you were just mentioning um, related to ascend for better health. And you know, we've we've been profiling some of uh, sort of the moonshots uh, that have been coming out of the White House. We haven't focused on the cancer moonshot yet, but um, I think this is really exciting because yes. It's great that we're focusing on cancer, but cancer or solving cancer is going to be a lot more than the next gene therapy and and monoclonal antibody, food, nutrition, access to healthy food and nutrition is all a part of this. Talk a little bit about what you're doing in support of President Biden's uh, cancer moonshot. Yeah, so the 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 president's President Biden's cancer moonshot, um, we, I call it 2.0 because he, he started it under the Obama administration and it's, it's such a critically important topic. We are, we've come together again to help reduce the cancer rate by at least 50% over the next 25 years and improve the experience of those who are living with cancers, those, those people and their families who are living with cancer. And we know that USDA has a unique role to play in reaching the goals of the cancer moonshot. You know, each day, USDA, our school meal programs reach around 30 million children. Can you, I mean, just, just imagine 30 million children from all communities and backgrounds across this country. And so we know that for, for young people, we talked about all the goals that are set forth in the science and research strategy. We need all those young people pre primed and prepared to take my job at some point. We need them ready to help lead the future. But we also know that school meals are some of the most nutritious food source for a lot of American children, thanks in large part to the nutrition professionals and the people who are working across the country. Um, USDA, um, we're really working to make sure that we have a healthy future by making sure that we, we provide healthy and nutritious foods to our, to our children. So, you know, the the, the unique nature that we have in USDA is a one-two punch. Um, I think about the feeding programs. USDA has invested $100 million to improve the nutritional quality of school meals, for example, through its Healthy Meals Initiative. And then we have our six research centers in ARS, our six nutrition research centers, mm -hmm. which are conducting nutrition research from gestation to I would say senior citizens, those of us over the age of 55. So we're conducting nutrition research on every part of the life cycle for Americans. And we, we have some of the best scientists, both in USDA ARS and in our land grant nutrition centers. So being able to bring those two things together is going to be 
a game changer for mm -hmm. making sure that we have healthy, nutritious um, meals for people that we can reduce. Yes, under the president's cancer moonshot, we want to help prevent cancer. And in response to the White House strategy on hunger, nutrition, and health, mm -hmm. we want to help to make sure that we help reduce chronic diseases. Yeah. And it's a, space, a special area that is very important to me. It's one of the areas that I'm extremely passionate about, being able to make informed, data-driven decisions about what we eat to have longer, healthier lives. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's where Ascend for Better Health comes in. Ascend is the Agriculture Scientific Center of Excellence on Nutrition and Diet for Better Health. So how do we use food and nutrition to improve the quality of life for Americans. With Ascend, we have created a virtual science center of excellence. Mm -hmm. And part of, that, um, part of that initiative is to create hubs in communities where people are. We wanna have an equitable approach to making sure that we can provide many communities with the data and information they need to make better informed choices. And so we started off in late last year, we announced the Center of Excellence, a nutrition hub at Southern University, mm -hmm. where we are focusing on the African-American community. Um, in fact, we spent the entire last year talking to communities across the country. We started with um, the African-American community in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, we met with a Hispanic community in Laredo, Texas. In fact, that community is 96% Hispanic. Uh, we heard from those communities about the challenges they face in, in terms of eating healthier diets, some of the things that are low hanging fruit that we can help accomplish mm -hmm. very quickly. And then areas where there are opportunities to bring multiple partners together to address those issues. Uh, we talked to our Native American community and uh, in North Dakota, um, mm -hmm. we talked to the 4-Hers because the young, the young folks, they have a lot to share. The youth have a very big perspective on how we address this topic. And so all of that information, many of these conversations that we have both virtually and those that I just mentioned that were in person, fed into the vision for a sin. And what we know is there's not a one size fits all. Mm -hmm. uh, when we look at some of the, the metrics and the standards that we're using, we want to make sure that we have data-driven standards and metrics. And that's where mm -hmm. precision nutrition comes in. There's an opportunity to be more precise in the guidance that we provide to certain populations. Um, in fact, the vision is that ultimately I want to be able to have a prescription just for me. Ira, that is very precise to me. Here are yeah. all of my metrics. And so now how should I how should I eat? How should I go forward? Uh, but right now, what we have before us is an opportunity to send our experts out into the community, to meet people where they are, to be able to take all of that amazing research, all of that amazing nutrition research. People are so surprised when they go into a nutrition research laboratory and they see all of the high-tech equipment. I'm not sure how they thought we got to some of the guidance that we give them, but there is a lot of science that goes sure. into talking about what your daily recommended uh, dose of vitamins are and, and those types of things. There's a lot of technology there. But we don't expect a lay person to come into our labs and, 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 and hang out with our scientists. In fact, we don't even expect them to read all of our thousands of peer review papers that we put out every year. <laughs> our, our goal is to take that information, to translate it. Remember, translation into action based on yep. our scientific research strategy. Translate it into digestible nuggets so that people can implement what we've learned. And so that's where we are with our nutrition hub at Southern University in partnership with USDA ARS, um, that we are actually putting that information into action, getting out into communities, talking with people, just really trying to help, you know, guide them to better health, a sin for better health. Yeah, it's, it's, it's an awesome story. I, you know, I, I love the, obviously the equity, the, the inclusive food system concepts there. And then, uh, you know, we've been talking a lot about just sort of accessibility where, you know, I, I may see my doctor, you know, once or twice a year, but I always have my supermarket. I always have, you know, the ability to think about nutrition and food, uh, at, whether it's the pharmacy, uh, at least convenience stores, what have you. So, you know, I, I, I really uh, enjoyed listening to that and, and, and how you're uh, unfolding that program. Um, you know, st again, staying on, um, 
uh, the theme, you know, well, this is actually even <laughs> more, more complex science, but I, I'd love to talk a little bit about um, the uh, $1.25 billion National Bio and Agri-Defense Facility, because clearly um, the last couple of years has uh, waken us all up to principles and concepts of biodefense uh, and for human health. Uh, we don't talk as much about agro defense as we possibly should, and here comes in you know a variety of themes, not just hey, uh, we got to make sure that these crops are not destroyed by some infection X, whatever it may be, uh, but something else that you know you've written about uh, in the past, uh, you've written about the concept of one health, uh, sort of how human crop. Uh, wildlife, all connected, uh, ag, you know, antibiotic uses is, is, is sort of a, a third pillar there. But um, walk us through a little bit. I, I know this is just getting set up, but yeah. if we could talk about what's going on in Kansas, I think this is a really important theme. Yeah, absolutely. So part of my role as, as chief scientist includes working with um, all of the MBAF leadership, uh, both in USDA and in the Department of Homeland Security. Um, I know you said it's just getting started, but for those of us who've been on the front lines of MBAF, it feels <laughs> like it's been a long time coming. Um, as ARS administrator, as you can imagine, I was very involved in um, all of the planning and the um, conduct of many of the steps that needed to be taken before we reached the, ri the ribbon cutting ceremony um, <laughs> last year. We were all very excited about that. Um, you know, the National Bio and Agro Defense Facility replaces Plum Island, which is our facility yeah. where we've conducted game-changing foreign animal disease research. And uh, when we look at um, our ability to develop vaccines and other countermeasures and surveillance for right. um, the animal diseases. It's one of the things that I think the country can be very proud of the work that's happened at Plum Island. And we will raise the game on that with the National Bio and Agro Defense Facility. Um, as you mentioned, first of all, it's a $1.25 billion BSL-4 biocontainment safety laboratory for It's the first one in the United States for agriculture. And um, so cutting edge research will happen in that state of the art facility. Um, we're very excited about this opportunity. Like I said, we have some of the best scientists in the world and it's not just my opinion uh, and I'm biased, but we have some credentials that say many mm -hmm. of our scientists are the best in their field, looking at diseases like foot and mouth disease, yep. African swine fever, you know, classical swine fever. We have, we have some of the best in the world and they're, they're great. And they work internationally and globally with other great scientists. And that's what's enabled us to help keep the food supply safe. And so that's what will happen at EMBAF. It's a great example um, of how we need to be prepared in this country so that we can't get ready when it's time to be ready. And so that's what EMBAF allows us to do. In fact, when I think about the work that was conducted under um, Plum Island and some of our other biocontainment facilities um, during the COVID, uh, the COVID pandemic. When we think about SARS COVID two, uh, what we know is that we didn't know um, which agriculture animals were susceptible to yeah. the virus, and so we were able to redirect uh, resources very quickly to be able to conduct the important science that needed to happen to protect our agriculture community. For example, what about cattle? What about swine? You know, we looked at um, poultry. We looked yeah. at the white-tailed deer, which is a, a, a vector for agriculture. And so we were able to conduct those studies very quickly in partnership with the land-grant universities. And, and we were able to deliver that information very quickly in pre-peer-reviewed publications so that not only the United States um, agriculture industry, but also globally, we were able to be able to protect our uh, food supply and to protect our producers, um, learning that many of the agriculture animals are not susceptible to SARS-CoV-2, mm -hmm. and it helped us be able to have an informed decision going forward. And so we were, we were very excited about MBAF. I know that DHS has been an amazing partner um, DHS is our partner at Plum Island, uh, mm -hmm. and um, and USDA will be the owner and operator of MBAF, and and our partnership with DHS will will continue to evolve. Coming back to um, the farmers now, because this is you know as as you've been talking about uh, innovation uh, and these technologies, you mentioned things like artificial intelligence and machine learning. Uh, clearly. 
farming is, is in 2024 is quite different than it used to be. Um, and, you know, uh, I had uh, the opportunity to do a show with um, the folks from uh, John Deere a couple of years ago talking about precision agriculture and, you know, the computer vision and all, hey, uh, the computer will tell us that's a weed. That is not. We need uh, a pound of fertilizer over here. Talk a little bit about, you know, as we transition to this agriculture 2.0 or whatever you want to call it, how do we inspire the next? I mean, clearly I'm inspired by it. I, I get involved in all this stuff. It's sort of the next generation, my kids that are coming along. Um, what are you doing to get sort of the next uh, generation interested in, in, in all things farming and agriculture? Yeah. So, you know, this is an area that I care deeply about. Uh, to me, uh, working with the youth is one of the most important roles that I play. Yeah. You know, hopefully um, we're doing a good job because we're, we're going to be encouraging a lot of young people to join us um, in, in agriculture. So, you know, we think about the we look about the demographics of farmers. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of people are really shocked that like the rest of us, you know, that population is aging. Uh, I think the average age of uh, producers right now is 58 years old. Mm -hmm. And um, and a large portion of those are over the age of 65. Mm -hmm. and, and, and then we look at, you know, the agencies I lead. You heard a little bit about, you know, the four agencies I lead and then the office of the chief scientist. Um, we have, you know, a large portion of those employees eligible to retire today. And in three years that grows and then that grows and it grows. And so we need to have our, our pipeline, you know, primed and um, ready to take our places. I don't know about you, Ira, but I don't want to work forever. And so it's <laughs> going to be important to have the youth join us in this in this in this work. Last mm -hmm. night I heard someone, I was at an event last evening and someone said, we want to put the fun back in farming. And, you know, in USDA, uh, I often tell you, the youth, you know, we need farmers and we don't have to be a farmer to help a farmer. Right. And so there's we need people at every intersection of agriculture. Well, the technology is one where we definitely need their help. When we think about the integration of precision agriculture, yeah. the technologies with precision agriculture. We talked a little bit about broadband, which is a fundamental basic. Mm -hmm. Now let's talk about the uh, the data, the just the enormous amounts of data that can be um, generated from a farming practice. The data itself is not where the value is. The data is, the value is when you can use technology to create precision decision tools, for example, predictive tools. Mm -hmm. to be able to have intelligent spraying or, or treatments, to be able to convert that into an app on a phone where a, produ a producer, she can stand in the middle of her field and be able to make informed data-driven decisions about how she moves forward that day because we've taken all that data in the back end and use all the technology to be able to have her, him or her put in some criteria and have us be able to de deliver to them an answer. Those are the types of things that I think are going to be important. Now, how do we train the next generation to be ready to help us move that to an, an even different level? And that's where some of the funding programs that we've had in, um, in the Biden-Harris administration, we think about the next gen program from leading to learning, which was sponsored by one of the large three pieces of uh, legislation that have been so important to helping us train uh, the next generation and really conduct some critically important uh, studies and research and programs in USDA. Um, and one of the things that we are very excited about is the American Rescue Plan um, funding of the from leading to learning, cultivating the next generation of agriculture professionals. We call it Next Gen. That program invests $262.5 million in our future. And so our goal is to touch some 20,000 students across America uh, to be trained, to be prepared to take uh, to take the helm of many of our many of our uh, agriculture enterprise um, locations, organizations. And so um, I'm excited about that program. We are working with our historically Black colleges, our tribal communities, our Native American and Hawaiian serving institutions, our Hispanic serving institutions, and all of our 1862s. And so we're just excited and um, I'm looking forward to what we can generate out of that program.
and along on along those notes i i notice uh, you know we we're i was uh reading up on uh what's going to be happening in february um 15th and 16th the usda's 100th annual agricultural outlook for i mean cultivating the future um you're going to be talking about as we were just discussing i was looking at the theme of your talk and uh, innovators discussing how we're changing the agricultural landscape and creating new opportunities for farmers of today and farmers of the future so <laughs> that, that was a nice segue um talk a little bit about uh what's going to be happening in february uh, at this uh 100th annual uh so you're going to have lots of speakers over 120 many different sessions it goes on for a couple of days um Say a few words about this, if you would, because I think we can also, we don't have to go to Arlington. We can also I think, watch this one as well. So, yeah. Please. So, so the Ag Outlook Forum, which is the short name for it, is what we all call it. But USDA's 100th Annual Agriculture Outlook Forum, Cultivating the Future, will take place on February 15th through 16th, 2024 at the Crystal City Gateway Marriott in Arlington, Virginia. And so the Outlook Forum is a unique opportunity to learn about the latest trends and developments in agriculture from leading experts and industry professionals. And as a part of the opening plenary session on February 15th, I'm so excited about this. I'll lead a fireside chat with Dr. Rod Shaw mm -hmm. um, of the Rockefeller Foundation, centered on realizing trans transformative change for the future of agriculture. Um, so I used to work with Raj. Raj used to be in this position as the Undersecretary and Chief Scientist, and I worked with Raj at that at that time, just an innovative, um, forward-thinking uh, leader. And so I'm excited to sit down with him to talk about how do we how do we transform agriculture? What are the big big bets in agriculture. Mm -hmm. And so I'm very excited about that. Now, registration is open and you can find more information on USDA's website. And as you said, our, uh, um, the pandemic demonstrated to us the power of virtual attendance. <laughs> and so, um, you know, if you can't make it to Arlington, Virginia, February 15th to 16th, we encourage you to register and attend virtually. It is an it's going to be a powerful, powerful moment. And the opportunity to celebrate 100 years of this forum, I think, is one you don't want to miss. I, 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 I'm looking forward to it. And uh, again, the, the connecting the themes of uh, farming of yesterday to the future is just uh, so exciting. And I, it's, yeah, it's going to be <laughs> quite, quite eye-opening and going to learn a lot. Um, uh, Dr. Jacobs, you know, while I have you, I know we're coming up against uh, a hard stop. You have other things to get to, but um, anything I missed, any other topics, uh, any final messages for our audience? Clearly, you're onto all things innovation, um, STEM, uh, the future of uh, agriculture, both for calories and beyond. But final messages uh, for our audience as, as we uh, wrap up our session with you today. Well, there, there are a few things that I, I, I wanted to share that I probably should go back and just share, talk a little bit about. And I think that the, I think what I need to share is the imperative on why healthy foods are so important. We talked a little bit about Ascend and uh, we talked about the Cancer Moonshot, uh, President's Cancer Moonshot Initiative. We talked about the White House Conference on Hunger, mm -hmm. uh, Nutrition and Health. And why are these things important? You know, I think I want to just share with you just a little bit more and what I think people need to know about sure. why what we're doing is so important. So diet related chronic diseases are prevalent among Americans and they pose a major public health problem. Um, uh, I will share with you that during the pandemic, the vulnerabilities of many of our communities were elucidated. My own community, for example, being um, feeling helpless, being a in an, being being in a position to not be able to save lives of some of our loved ones was uh, um, it was just it was it was debilitating. Yeah. Not having the power to be able to go back and rewrite history to make sure that people are healthy enough to be resistant and tolerant to recover from COVID um, nineteen, and so knowing that. Chronic diseases like diabetes, hypertension, kidney disease, cardiovascular disease, all of the things that um, I know in my community um, we suffer from. You know, I, I, I suffer from most of, most of the ones I just named. But we okay. know that today six in 10 people have at least one chronic condition um, and four in 10 people have two or more chronic diseases. And we know that many of these diseases are preventable. 
that they're largely preventable through proper nutrition and healthy living. Um, COVID-19 was a wake up call for me um, as I lost a number of members of my family there mm -hmm. in Georgia. And uh, so that's why this is such a passionate topic for me, because there are a lot of things in our lives Ira, that we can't control. And we, what we want to be able to help all Americans do is control what they eat and how they live their lives. And so how can we provide the important information and data that's going to be critical to helping all Americans live longer, healthier, high quality lives. And that's why a lot of the work we do is so important. And so I wanted to make sure that I shared that with you as well. No, no, that, it, it's, it's an awesome message. And again, it comes back to, uh, to sort of the core of our show as well. And um, I, I just am uh, so uh, impressed by sort of the scope of, of your portfolio and the things that you have to think about on a daily basis and just really honored that uh, you took the time to to come and talk to us uh, a little bit about it today and, and really wishing you and the, the 8,500 employees that are responsible for these initiatives the best as you continue to to proceed and progress with the with the programs. Um, again, for everybody who uh, are going to be listening uh, to this episode of our show uh, across the various podcast networks, or if you're going to be watching on our YouTube channel, again, you've been spending time with Dr. Shavonda Jacobs-Young, Undersecretary for Research, Education, and Economics, and Chief Scientist, United States Department of Agriculture. Dr. Jacob Young, I want to, again, thank you so much for taking the time out of your schedule to come talk to us for a little while. Obviously, thank you for what you do. And as we always say on our show, you know, thanks for helping to create a better tomorrow for so many people out there via what you're doing. A really great story. Thank you so much for having me and uh, just encourage everyone to visit us um, at USDA Science uh, to take part in some of our initiatives uh, to join us. You know, I've come a long way from the paper machine in paper <laughs> science and engineering. Um, however, those taught me important lessons that I hope I'm applying to be able to really impact how Americans move forward in a high quality, uh, nutritious way. Outstanding. And we will put all, as I mentioned, all the links to, uh, to this in the bio of the show. Great awesome. having you. Thank you for having me.